Like, I can't remember, but like, it's like two days before he was resurrected. There's that day that you call it, I don't know, on Sunday? Oh, so yes, that Saturday. Saturday. So there, there's events in the scriptures that are symbolic. Objects? Any objects that you think of? Scriptures. Leah Hona? Yes. Light. What? Light? Yeah, like light. Yeah, go ahead, Abby. Oh, I was just saying a light. A lot of times um, it talks about, you know, you wouldn't put a candle under a bushel, that type of thing. But light in general, so either candle or lamp. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, good. Love it. The rock. Yeah. Oh, a fig tree. Yep, very good. Yeah, a what? Tree of life. Yep, objects. Uh, rod of Aaron. That whole story in uh, uh, in uh, Exodus or was it Exodus or Leviticus? No, number seventeen, where it, it's the the twelve the twelve rods that go into then the one grows, but the rod of Aaron. I mean, that was all, all of that one there. Actions. How about actions? Actions as symbols for Christ. Sacrament. Baptism. Baptism. Intercession as a whole. Stuff. Christ. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Saving. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Him. Yeah. Yeah, and these could overlap for sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, Isaac and Jacob. There was an action that that was right. So yeah, very good. How about names? Oh man. Yeah. There. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, Bethlehem. Bethlehem is house of bread, right? Daniel. God, I mean, there's there are lists and lists of names that that were symbols of Christ. Yeah, right, right. They're a bunch of how about places or locations as symbols for Christ? Bethlehem. Jerusalem as a whole was the holy city, right? What's that? Mount Sinai? Oh, which one? Oh, Exodus. Enoch. Mount Sinai, right? Yeah, so yeah. The Enoch, yeah. Kolob, right? Uh, those type of places. So is, here's, and here's the last one. How about food? Yeah. Bread, water, wine, manna. Quail, right? The man and the quail and the yeah, yeah, yeah. Lamb because of the the Passover lamb that they'd sacrifice, you know, and Passover foods, which are bitter herbs and bread without leaven and and goat. It could oh to goat, yes. The the uh, the uh, Yes, yeah, scapegoat. Or the uh, scapegoat. Yeah, scapegoat. Yeah, that, very good. Very good. So, when you guys see this picture, what's the what's the what's the symbolism here? The right, the offering of, of the lamb. Right. So, just go with me really quick. Moses chapter five, four through eight. Moses five, four. Through Who wants to read that one for us? Mo? Yep. Moses 5, 4, 3. You got it? Yeah. All right. So Milo, go ahead. And Adam and Eve, his wife, called upon the name of the Lord, and they heard the voice of the Lord from the way toward the Garden of Eden, speaking unto them, and they saw him not. But they were shut out from his presence. And he gave unto them commandments that they should worship the Lord their God and should offer the firstlings of their flocks for an offering unto the Lord. And Adam was obedient unto the commandments of the Lord. And after many days, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Adam, saying, Why dost thou offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Adam said unto him, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. 
But then the angel spake, saying, This thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, which is full of grace and truth. Wherefore thou shalt do all that thou doest in the name of the Son, and thou shalt repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. Okay, very good. So when you look at that in the in the symbol and the, the symbol there, what he talks about it there in those verses, what are some important truths that we're really being taught there about Jesus Christ through the symbol of the Lamb, based on what the Lord says there? Say it one more time. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? From that, yeah, he just uh, simply acting on the basis that the Lord tells him to do it. And I love that. Very good. Any other truths we learn? Okay. He cannot lie in his person. Why is a lamb a good symbol for that? They're pretty helpless. Generally speaking, the, the a sheep is about the it's the equivalent of a potato in the animal kingdom, right? I mean, they are pretty. They are pretty, I mean, they are, they really have no defense. They have nothing to, they have no resistance to any kind of predator. I mean, they really are, they are, they are about the meekest of lowliest of of animals in the animal kingdom um, that, uh, that exists. So yeah, it's a good symbolism that way. And this is just talking about the lamb, right? The little lamb. Any other things in there that we learn about Jesus Christ based on just this, this the symbolism of the lamb? Okay. Has to be a firstborn without blemish, which means what? Without blemish. Okay. Can't be lame. It can't be. Yes. Yes. Were the requirements for its purity? No, I think other than it just had to. There couldn't be any kind of physical defect back to us. So first one is like it's precious. First one, um, in in many cultures, and also. You're not entirely sure if you're going to have, um, if you're going to have another one. And I'm supposing the firstborn, there's a chance it will be the healthiest of the block. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that may be. Also, the firstborn receives all, receives all the. Inherits all the, the right, inherits. right. Which means that we become joint heirs with he because he's the heir, right? To, to yeah. be a joint heir with Christ, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for us to become an actual heir is 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 set on the very foundation of what Christ had to do to become yeah. an heir, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Good thing we're good thing we're not at an auction, man. You'd have bought a horse right there. <laughs> yeah good so uh any under any has anyone ever associated with sheep i mean anyone ever been around sheep yes. goats <laughs> they're not too far from sheep they're oh really goats really are really totally really off the sheep goats are just the opposite of sheep it's okay sheep are cute Goats, yeah, go, there's a reason why they say goats and sheep. But, you know, we, we refer to our children. Is our children a sheep or a goat? We always, Deb and I always say that. You know, is it, is it, goats have their own mind, right? They're like, they're doing their their own thing. 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, probably true. Um yeah. That's probably true, yes. Um one thing one one cool thing about sheep in the uh, in Idaho, uh Don Gunner, he was he was he raised sheep. Uh, me and his me and his, his son were just really good friends. So I'd work up there on their farm on the summer, but he just raised sheep. But they would have um and I don't know if they were Muslims that would come, but twice a year they would come and they would get a sheep and they would just they would kill it right on the spot. And they did some fascinating stuff. But I this is one thing I learned about sheep. I never I never do this until I actually saw it, but they would kill sheep, they just they cut its throat, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, so that would. But here's the interesting thing: a sheep makes no. There's like no protest. It, there is. They don't make. They, they don't make a sound. I'm sorry, let me mute that. I think I can mute that. Oh, did I? Speak? Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah. I thought, sorry, I went to mute that sound. I thought maybe I muted you guys, but they they make no. There's no. There's no protest to their to their being killed. Uh, man, I saw that. I saw that just sheep after sheep. Then they do another interesting thing is they make like an incision and it's like back in its back leg and uh, make an incision there and they stick a tube up and they just blow. And it makes all the skin. They just keep blowing and blowing. And it makes all the skin separate from the flesh. Totally, a totally fascinating thing. So when they skin it, it just, the skin basically just falls off. It just, it's, they have their own skill of doing things, but that was one thing I know about sheep is they, they make they're they're just quiet when they're when they're being when they're being sacrificed. Um. So it's it's a it's a it's a good symbol that way. Um. So when we think about today, symbols that we use for Christ, what are symbols that we use today most that represent Christ? Then there's the easy one, but are there, are there other ones that you think beyond? So the easy one you're thinking is what? Ross. Okay, I was thinking of I was thinking of another easier one. I was thinking of an easier one than that. I was thinking of what? The sacrament, right? So so sacrament side, what were you guys thinking? And obviously I was thinking something else. You guys were thinking something else. So the cross is a is a symbol, although maybe not one it's is no. I think everyone in our church knows it, but it's definitely a symbol for for the that's come to represent Christ, right? What were you thinking? The Christus, okay, okay, good. Any other symbols that we use for Christ? Today. I'm just thinking things, things that we tend to say more today. Maybe, maybe not, maybe this is just me, but North Star, right? Uh, is a is a we see it on we see it on cars a lot and maybe not so much us but uh one that's used a lot today the fish oh yeah the fish symbol right yeah yeah it could be yeah i think a lot i think a lot of christian groups have adopted uh, that but on there yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So, uh, this is by Elder uh, by Elder Hall. He says, by offering their their own little symbolic lamb in mortality, Adventist posterity were expressing their understanding and their descendants their understanding of and their and their dependence upon the atoning sacrifice of of Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. You know, you think about that. I mean that that animal sacrifice is used how much between Adam and the Passover at the time of the death of Christ. I mean, it's just this, it's a crazy amount of, I mean, the crazy amount of, I mean, at the Passover in Jerusalem, I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of sheep that are being sacrificed just in that event. And yet, what? I mean, that whole sacrifice was to. It was to help them understand that Christ was going to come in and atone for them 
and then he comes and they they totally they totally miss it right so what does that teach us about symbols okay yeah so i mean the point of the symbol is to the point of the symbol is to help us understand what christ does right it's, also, each symbol represents a different part of what of Christ's mission. Uh -huh. Right? In one hand, he is the the Jews at the time were looking for the lion. Right. They were looking, they were so excited about this lion, right. Christ. Uh -huh. That they missed the lamb. Yeah, so they never tied. They never tied the lion, the lion of Judah, to a conquest of of sin. They always they tie it to the conquest. They they they, they, they put an earthly application to it, right? They missed the the meaning. Yeah, they missed the mark, right? Yeah, they get the symbol, and then they stumble on it, right? Good. Other thoughts that you think on that? This is all symbolic. You will see that they mention multiple times. This is all symbolism, and is all the whole point of this is to focus on Jesus Christ. I think that that's very interesting. I think that we again as humans, which focus so much on the symbols, that something again what they're supposed to symbolize. Right. Yeah, I love that. Matter of fact, I thought you guys were going to go more on the on some of the temple symbols when we talk about today. But man, temple symbols are. I mean, yeah, I mean, in the whole, I mean, if you go to the temple lately, that that whole that whole ceremony has really gone to focus us more on 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 the mission of Christ. Yeah, so I love that. Good, good, good. good. Right. Right. Yeah. So what? So how does that? How does that translate to to symbols today? Does it mean if you can you apply that to anything today? That's the sacrament. That's the sacrament. That's not right. There's nothing magic about the the bread in terms of it's renewing a covenant, right? It's there's nothing magic about what I mean in 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 and of the bread itself. It could be a potato chip. It could be potato skins in point in history and wars and stuff like that. Right? It's the it's the it's the renew of a, of that covenant, right? That ordinance. Yeah, I love that. Good. Any other thoughts? Which is always funny on the sacrament because man, you see some, you see some funny things that people have about the sacrament that all, all, all of a sudden taking of it becomes so much more important. You know, <laughs> just <laughs> I honestly have one guy. This is when I was a bishop in up in Utah. Me and my wife were coming back from a late night. We were down to see a play in Salt Lake, and it was like we were driving back. It was like eleven thirty, almost midnight. We were coming through Ogden. Back to Cash Valley, we had another 45 minutes to drive. And I get a phone call. And it's one of my board members. She is just freaking out. Freaking out. I mean, she is freaking out. I need to meet with you. I need to meet with you. I need to meet with you. I'm like, okay. you know, so what am I thinking? I'm right there with my wife. So I really can't get into it with her. And I said, okay. And I said, it's I, she, all my whole ward is right. I have my whole ward was an apartment complex that sat on half a block, right? 300 members in it and uh in my church was right my church was right by it and i said hey i'll be there in 45 minutes I said, and my wife was smithy so i could go meet with her and and uh we get there she's sitting on the curb she has a friend with her and uh we go into my office and she has she's made a mistake right she's made a bad mistake but she she is so worried she wants to confess it so bad that so she so she can take the sacrament on sunday but does that thing 
But you confess that it takes time to like repent, right? Yeah, what's her misunderstanding? So did you explain to her that Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. But what's, but you see, she just sees that she sees it as what I got to be able to take the sacrament. So, so right. She, it's a, it's a total misunderstanding of what, why do we take the sacrament? Right. It was, she wasn't so worried about if she was worried more about what she had done versus she's more concerned about what she's not able to take on Sunday. Right, and it yeah, it's, but sometimes man, if we can get so we, all of a sudden, if if we can get so focused on we can get so focused on the symbol, we forget the reason for the symbol, and why and why God has given us that symbol. Four, four on there. You said you got them. Well. Yeah, so here we go. Let's read this one here, and then let's go to the, the next little part. This is by Bruce O'Reilly. I love this point, this statement. You got it? It is also for to work with facilities everywhere and to use them in keeping me and keeping care of his laws uppermost in our minds. Okay, so let's ask this first. Why does God give us ordinances? Well, and actually, like, he's just be within the boundaries. Okay. And so, yeah. All right. So, so let's build on this. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. Let's build on it. Okay. Yeah. Also, the ultimate goal is to get back to Heavenly yeah. Father. Uh -huh. And in order for that to occur, certain requirements must be met in forms of ordinances. Covenants must be made. Okay. Those covenants are made through ordinances. Okay. So God, God has a plan for us. He says, hey, I want you. We know his, his purpose is that he wants us to come back and live with him, right? Mm -hmm. Is he going to force you? Uh, That's Satan's plan, right? So he's not going to force you. He wants you to do this. So he gives us an ordinance and he says, okay, I'm going to give you the ordinance of baptism. If you want to come back to me and you want me to help, if you want me to help you become like me, here is the ordinance of baptism. So we show our willingness that, hey, I don't, God, I don't want God to force this on me. I willingly accept and I enter into this this promise, this, through this ordinance, make this covenant with God. Because God is never going to force someone to do it. He says, hey, I want you to be together as families forever. I'm not going to force you to do it. If you want to do it, then what? Then come to the temple and be sealed. Enter, make these, make these covenants in the temple. Right. We then we come in, and that's how we show. Then once we're into that, then what? Then what happens? Have to follow. Then we start showing. Then we start showing signs to God that hey, I want. To, I now I want. I want to be blessed. So and I want help to do these things. And we give signs then to God. We give Him. We show Him evidence that we want to. Keep our covenants, keep moving on that path, and then what does he do? Helps us. He helps us, right? He helps us because he's not going to force it on us. We could come in and make those covenants and then go, oh, I'm I'm not going to do anything. We don't give him any signs. We don't give him any witness, any evidence that we want to receive his help. So then what do we just kind of we just kind of drift there, right? So, so every divine ordinance, performance ordained of God, every sacrifice, symbolism, similitude was established to testify of, of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So 
in that last part. We got that. So here's what I want you to do. Here's just four examples. And I think these are kind of fun examples to look at. There's Israelites receive bread from uh, manna from heaven, right? So Exodus, you can also go to the John one. That's where he gets the bread of life in John. I just kind of put that in there. Um, there's water comes out of the rock, Exodus 17, 1 through 6. The day of atonement, Leviticus 16, 2 through 6, verse 17. There, you can go to Hebrews and read about that one too. Uh, Israelites saved from certain numbers, 21. We kind of talked a little bit about this one, 21, 4 through 9. But just pick one of those. I don't care which one you pick. One that kind of looks interesting to you. And just look at it. And then on the side there, on the right-hand side, there's three questions that I just want you to kind of ponder and think about as you read those, those verses. And I'm just going to give you a few minutes to look at it, and then we'll come back and just, just share what you what you learned. You could talk about any one of those questions that or anything that you, any insight that you gained uh, as you kind of look at uh, what is this teaching about uh, Jesus Christ? How does it pointing us to Jesus Christ? Can you guys online see that? Mahe and Abby and Carissa and Amelia? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm just curious. Somebody took the bread. Anyone here take the bread one? We got a couple. Anyone? Anyone take the rock? Water in the rock. Got that one. Day of Atonement. Up on that one. Serpent. Okay. Good. Just another minute or two.
Okay. We can go, anyone that wants to go first, you can just tell us what, I mean, you don't have to read the verse. You can just say, hey, here's kind of just talk about based on one of those three questions or any other insights that you had that you just want to share. Which one did you do? Uh-huh. Huh? All the garments and all the temple clothes that we can in Hebrew. Um, a young bullock person offering in the land for a burnt offering. Uh -huh. And this will be to the sacrifice for all the sins of all of Israel. Uh -huh. And nobody, I found this interesting, verse 17, and there shall be no man in the chapter of the congregation and go up and make an atonement in a holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And then the other, I'm glad I looked together in scriptures and Hebrews, and it kind of goes to explain that, um, which was a figure for the time and present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that did not make him that did this service perfect as pertaining to the contents, which stood only in meats and drinks and battles and of battle. But Christ being, being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Uh, neither by the blood of those in past, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained his death for us. Yeah, so that's where they would walk in once a year. They, on the day of atonement, they would walk into the Holy of Holies and, and, and that's what they put the blood over the, right? And, but yeah, and so you went to the Paul, where Paul talks about that. The symbolism there is what? For, for them is that. Yeah. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, the whole thing was a was a, a total symbolism of not much. I mean, not much different than the than the, the the individual sacrificing of lamb. But this was one big event for all of all. I mean, all of Israel, right? Jesus Christ atones for the sins of the world, and if you want to take it even a step further, of worlds without number right oh. yeah there's a there's a there's a beautiful symbolism of the, I mean they, yeah there's a lot to study in that isn't there I mean to look at yes. yep yep the symbols are meant to yeah, get you thinking and look at the different facets of it. So I love it. Very good. Good. So let's go. Let's go. We could dive more into that one. Let's go to other ones. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Um, and God commanded them to like make a snake and put it on a pole. Right. And then out in the Alma verses, it included a detail that the Old Testament did not. Uh -huh. And that some people refused right. to look upon the snake and because of that they died. Right. So I guess the uh, message of this is, you know, Christ offers us, you know, blessing and healing, but it's up to us to soften our hearts and to accept it. Okay. Good. So give me give me a modern day example. So here, so let, let me set it up like this. They're bitten by a snake. If you're bitten by a snake, you know, you know what, one of the things they tell you, and I don't know if you get this here, but in like Utah, we get this a lot. We always do this when we take guys on camping trips and stuff like that. It's like, you don't catch the snake. You don't go, you don't go trying to kill the snake. <laughs> what do you do? You get help. You go get help, right? They're going to figure out what kind of snake it is, right? You don't go, people would get mad and all of a sudden they got to take the, the precious three minutes to chase the snake down and club it, you know, you go get help. You don't go after the snake, right? So the, so this is a gospel paradox, right? It's a, it's a paradox in terms of they are bitten by the snake. They hate the snake. Now to be healed from the snake, they have to what? They have to look at the snake. And many just couldn't do it, right? They're just like, that's, you know, like it's a, it's a paradox. To be healed from the snake bite, you have to go through the, you have to go to the snake, right? 
Well, we have all kinds of gospel paradoxes like that, that many of us are, we get affected by it today, such as what? Temptation. Like what? Well, I'm... Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think you're I think you're right there. Like, so if someone if someone does something to us that wrongs us, we have anger towards that person, right? Mm -hmm. The paradox is that to get rid of that anger, you have to what? You got to forgive that. You have to forgive them, right? Doesn't mean you have to be best friends with them. It doesn't mean anything, but you do have to. You have to you have to forgive them and let God deal with it and not not cling on to it. Right? We have all kinds. Could you think of others? I mean, there's all kinds of them. That we, like if you of. if you yeah. have a fear of something, like you can't just avoid it. You have. I mean, in my experience, yeah. like you have to move through it. Like, um. I've often had like a fear of like speaking up, but like avoiding situations where I have to speak up hasn't like fixed it. It's like actually being in situations and like speaking up anyways is what feels like the, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, it's like, that's the salvation. Yeah. Listen, I think that that's a huge one. We have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this church that won't accept callings because why? Yeah. They're they're scared they're scared of to do it. They're scared that that, that they're going to stand up in front of people. They're scared they're scared that they're going to have to. It's going to get them out of their comfort zone. And the paradox is what? It's just what you said, right? You got to you got to do what you. Well, you got you got to trust in the Lord. You have to overcome it and trust the Lord will. He will help you do it. Yeah, you got to step into the. You got to step into if you want to if you want to receive light. You have to step into the. You have to take that step into the unknown, and then the Lord will. Light will give you the light, so you take the step. Yeah, so it's. Yeah, so there's paradox, right? Yeah, so I love that one. Very good. Give me another one. I got time for one more. Anyone online? I like to like the simpleness of the way. Oh, which one? Uh huh. The simpleness of the way. Right. Yeah. So. Right. But yeah. Just thank you. Thank you. Yes. Right. Right. But you get caught up in the process of Right. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. You got it. You always got to bring it back to what is the symbol of? It's it's if where is Christ in this? Yeah, go ahead. So I did bread. Oh, I was gonna say sense. Oh good. Well you guys you guys you guys team teach on it. Go ahead. Um, so In verses one through four, the reason why the Lord sends bread is because the people of Israel are complaining. Oh, we're so hungry, we might as well just go back in and hang out with the Egyptians and be slaves again. And um, the Lord's like, "Don't! I'll provide for you. Here's our rain down bread, and just follow these instructions. This is the way that I'll provide enough." Don't take more than you need. Right. Except on on the on, except, for, on the except, Sabbath, take double portions, except, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. He gave clear, simple instructions uh -huh. on this is well, they couldn't do it. Right. right. And so one one of the things. It said, so the Lord was told them, do not take more than an omar, which is, and in verse 36, it's like, an omar is tenth of the ephah, 
which is five gallons. So, wow. So it's one tenth of five gallons for each. So half a gallon. Yeah. Okay. And so that is how much they will. And so, so enough to provide. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't your excess. Mm -hmm. And yet they couldn't. They couldn't follow that. The some old things. Yeah. So what's how how do how do we how do we apply that to us today, Perkin? If we take that symbolism of manna, in the instructions the Lord gave them on gathering it. How do we apply that today that helps us, that strengthens our faith in Christ? Yeah. Right. That's a big bullseye. You're a, you're a wise senior. <laughs> wise senior. In the, in the, in the uh, Lehi's vision, right? Or Yeah, Lehi's vision. Remember the two people that were holding the rod? Yeah. What are what was what was the word that he used to describe the two people that hold the rod? One group would he used this word to describe it, and they would get to the tree and then they would be ashamed and fall away. The other group he used this word to describe it, but they never fall away. The people that fall away, how did he how did he describe the way they held their the rod? They cling to it. The ones that go to the tree and never fall away, they how do they hold it? The phrase he uses, they they hold fast. So there was a group that never there's a group. So there's three three groups of people. There's a group that never grabbed hold of the rod and they're just lost from the get go, right? There's those that cling to it, they make it to the tree, but they end up falling away. And there are those that hold fast to it and stay. and they stay, right? So clinging is an interesting, the, the clinging versus the holding fast, whatever that means, but at least the holding fast, it implies that there is a consistency, right? There's a consistency that that is we are consistent with our scripture studies. We're consistent with our services. We're consistently doing these things that um, that become signs to God that we want to receive his power, right? That is that is a better thing than having this scarce mentality. Like, oh, I got to study the scriptures. I got to cling to it in desperation because something bad is happening in my life. And then I go and then I hang on to it right there. I cling to it. But then the then the bad thing ends or something. Then you, it's not that big of an issue anymore. The consistency is the power that comes versus just the I got to hoard this now, and then. Time will pass, and you know it's not consistent, right? He's teaching them to be he's teaching them to be consistent on it. So I love that. Good. Any other thoughts on that? Well, one thing my mind was going a different way about that. Is, yeah. Um, not to put too much on your plate at any one time. Yeah. In this culture and this day and age, it's very easy to put so much and it's overwhelming. And every once in a while, we need to take some time to, to kind of rest and to calibrate and to remember what really matters. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just trusting, it's trusting the Lord. Hey, here's what I can do. And here's some people get in this mindset of I've got to, I got to do this and I got to do this. You know, and we get people that get out of balance in their life and get, they get out of balance in the church. Because they feel like they got to do everything, they get out of balance with their family. I mean, they just get out of balance. And the key is to be directed by the Spirit, be governed by the Spirit, do the things you can, but be can be consistent at it. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a that's definitely a hazard. Lord is teaching them. Lord is teaching them not to be trust. Trust me that the. Manna will be there on Monday. It's going to be there on Monday. You're going to go a day and it's not going to be there. <laughs> it's going to be there on, on Monday. Rest on the Sabbath. Right? They, they, they have a hard time doing that. Yeah. Very good. Well, anything else on that? Yeah. You take the
they're like, we're not going to feel the spirit as strongly or like, um, to just have a look at that spiritual strength that we've gathered and we'll have to get through that time and then understand that we will. That the light always shines again. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, you hope there's you you put a reserve of oil in your in your life. Yeah, great. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Not everything goes perfect, right? I mean, you can your best efforts. You're showing God. You're giving God the. You're giving God the signs, the evidence that. But there are still times where things will. It rains. It rains on everybody. On the good and the evil, right? Yes. Very good. I love that. Great. So good. Well, I hope you think about symbols as we come across symbols. It's funny. I, I put these two books in here and we'll end on these. Uh, if you really like symbols, this one here is by uh, Alonzo Gaskill. His is really good. I like this one a little bit better. This is by Joseph Lee McConkie. It's gospel symbolism. It's This one's a lot older. And anytime a newer guy comes back and he does the research on the on the they always tend to look at some more stuff. He does some interesting stuff in here. Well, he'll take some really specific things that you go, I never thought of that as a as a symbol, but uh, he does a lot more with numbers and names. Uh, he'll and McConkie does a lot more with scriptural image, scriptural symbols in terms of stories and things that are in the in the stories themselves. So, but if you're ever into symbols or kind of good cool things that have you go through the scriptures and you're looking for stuff that, that they all point to Christ. I and mean, that's a good thing about those books. They really do show that man, symbols in the scriptures teach us about Christ and his mission and how to how to strengthen our our faith and and uh, in God's power to save us. Guys, thank you for your comments, your discussions there. We will have a closing prayer. Um someone on the line. Uh Mahe, do you want to give us a closing prayer? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, for the online. Lesson. Thanks, Abby. Appreciate you. Carissa, thank you. Amelia, glad you joined us back.